Um, this time I was, I was asked to talk about TAG and ROTAM. And I think that uh, the, 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 the important thing here is made easy. So I think that the idea here is not, not to teach you how to interpret TAG ROTAM, because actually it's very easy. You don't need any teaching lesson actually on that one. But it's basically to give you an idea. What are these two tests? What, what they really are capable of and what their limitations. And I think I'll be very happy if at the end you'll be able to, uh, to, to understand how these two tests work for those who have never seen it. So disclosures here, and please note that neither TAG nor ROTEM, I don't have any disclosure to make, so they still have a chance you know, to support my research and get their names on my disclosure. So the only disclosure I have is the CIHR award that I have. So, okay, so let's start. So there are a few basic concepts. Most of them I told you already in my previous lecture. So the first one is that there are two types of bleeding. There's the mechanical bleed, and there's the coagulopathic bleed. The mechanical bleed, very easy. You have a torn vessel. You have a torn organ. There's blood pouring out. If I make a hole in the aorta, it's a mechanical bleed. Blood pours out through that hole. Coagulopathic bleeding is the bleeding that's caused by the body inability to form an appropriate strong clot. Okay? So for the mechanical bleed, if I make a hole in the aorta, does giving plasma make any difference? No, unless you get the bag of plasma and you compress the aorta, whether you have the hole, Otherwise, it's, it's not going to be helpful for anything. So the coagulopathic bleeding you treat with blood products, you correct what deficit it is, while the mechanical bleed you treat with surgery or engine embolization. So as I mentioned to you, 2003 was a pivotal year with Brahe's paper. Until 2003, that's what we thought. We thought the patients became coagulopathic because they bled. So they bled so much that then they lost all their clotting elements and they become coagulopathic. And on top of that, they become coagulopathic because we gave them saline, because they became cold, because they became acidotic, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We know that's no longer true. After 2003, we realize that you don't have to bleed, you don't have to be diluted, you don't have anything to be coagulopathic. All you need to be coagulopathic is to suffer a trauma. So coagulopathy in trauma is something endogenous, some inherent to, to the trauma itself. Okay? And that's complex. It's not simple. It's many clotting problems occurring at the same time, changing over time. And if your patient becomes coagulopathic, their chance of dying increases dramatically. So the first problem is, since 2003 now, is every time you resuscitate someone, a trauma patient, you have to take into account that this patient may or may not be coagulopathic. If this patient is coagulopathic, it's coagulopathic early, you have to deal with this problem early. And this is not a simple problem. If this patient is not coagulopathic, then it's not a big deal. So the problem number two that we have is that, as I mentioned before, this problem is complex. We know that our trauma patients are anticoagulated because they have the release of APC. And I use the, it's equivalent to have heparin on board. This patient cannot form a clot. But this patient also has a problem with excessive fibrinolysis. Even if they form the clot, the clot is dissolved too fast. Those are the two main mechanisms, but we know there are other things too. We also talked last time about lack of fibrinogen, or fibrinogen not working. I'll add one more. Maybe the problem is platelets. Platelets are not working. And again, too, so there are so many other things that can actually make your patient coagulopathic. So just blindly throwing blood products to your patients, it's not enough you may actually be giving the wrong blood product or the wrong amount to the wrong patient at the wrong time. And you're not helping your patient. So ideally what you want to know is that what's the problem? 
what is wrong with this patient's coagulation, and then you correct that problem. Okay? That's the ideal one. So then, and this is how I ended the, the lecture earlier today, was that if you have someone uncontrollably bleeding, what you do, you blindly start giving blood to this patient, blood products, you assume that this patient is coagulopathic, but then, uh, what ha and then as quickly as possible, start getting some lab, start getting some lab to tell you what the problem is, and then you treat that. Otherwise, if your patient has not an uncontrollable bleeding, then you should use the lab to guide your resuscitation. You should not give plasma to someone just because they're bleeding. Okay? And, and I know that's, that's obvious, everybody agrees, yes. But then what happens when you have a patient that's in front of you and the patient is bleeding, say, my gosh, is this patient coagulopathic or is this a mechanical bleed? And actually, often you end up you know, giving plasma and you regret, and often you end up not giving plasma, and then later on you regret. So the idea is that you should, you should find a way to actually know whether the patient you're treating, what's wrong with this patient, and what do they need? How should you treat them? Okay. The problem is we all know that the traditional lab tests, like INR, PTT, platelet count, they are not good. They were never meant for trauma, and they have limitations too. So they're, even when you have them, they are not that helpful. So it has been proposed that maybe we should look at other tests, and two other lab tests have come out, and one of them is called TAG, thromboelastography, and that one's called ROTAM, is rotational thromboelastometry, and that's what we're gonna talk now. And, uh, and I hope that over the next uh, 15 minutes, you're gonna become an expert in TAG and ROTAM. Okay, so TAG, you have it here on the right-hand side, have it here, and then Rotem on the other side. And these tests actually have been around for a long time. More than 50 years they do exist, and they have not been very used until now, uh, except in a few niches, like a cardiac surgery sometimes, and liver transplantation. But the fact is that only after they were computerized, actually they become much, much more practical, these two tests. And that has been recent. So the two tests are very similar. If you notice, they have a little cup at the bottom, and then they have a pin. So what happens is that you put liquid blood inside the cup, and you push the cup against the pin, and then in the tag, that's the right-hand side there, the cup oscillates. On the Rotem, the pin oscillates. So it's completely different, huh? two completely different techniques. So it's a... <laughs> and a Oh, there's one more difference between them. Thromboelastography is produced, manufactured in the United States, and Rotem is manufactured in Europe. And you're gonna see that most Americans have experience with TAG, Europeans have experience with Rotem. And those are basically the difference between them all. And what you get, you get a graph. So as you can see here, this is a straight line. This is the graph from TAG. This is a straight line, so it means there's no resistance on the pin. The blood is liquid, okay? As the clot starts forming, you start getting this line going up, this line coming down, and just show how quickly the clot's forming. And then it reaches a maximum amplitude in here, means how strong the clot is, and then it shows how quickly the clot dissolves and becomes liquid again. So it shows you from the beginning, from initiation, propagation, amplification, to lysis. And because it shows you the whole coagulation, you can know where the problem is. So let's say the maximum amplitude is not very strong, means your clot is not very strong. What are you missing? What makes a, a clot strong? Platelets and fibrinogen. So if the, if the maximum amplitude is not that wide, you know that the problem is a clot that's not good, it's not strong enough. And this is the row term uh, uh, graphs. The Rotem has four channels, so it gives you four different tests at the same time, while the tag gives you only one. And basically what it does, it measures, it uses uh, something that triggers the intrinsic pathway, something that, tri that triggers the extrinsic pathway, and then here, the poison, the platelets, so all that's left is fibrinogen function, 
And then here, with the protonin, they poison the fibrinogen, and then all that's left is platelet function. So in the end, you have an information of what's going on. Again, exact the same graph. It's just different triggers of the coagulation. And actually here, I had someone there at Sunnybrook putting both graphs together. The top one is TAG, the lower one is ROTAM, and you can see the two graphs are very, very similar. So on TAG, that time when the blood is liquid to start with, that straight line on TAG is called R, on ROTAM is called CT. On TAG, the maximum amplitude, like how strong the clot is, is called MA, and the, in the ROTAM is called MCF. But they both, all they do, they measure the amplitude of the clot, how strong, how good this clot is. But you see they're very similar. And, uh, and in fact, this, uh, these are all the parameters here. So R in TAG equals CF on TAG, and they measure initiation of the coagulation. And then let's go to MA. MA measures, is the same thing as MCF on the ROTAM. They measure the clot tensile strength, and they're usually associated to platelet and fibrinogen. So then you know if your clot's not strong enough, you're missing platelet and fibrinogen. Okay, so far? Tremendously exciting, isn't it? Well, lab tests are really something that we love, as, especially surgeons, we love lab tests. So, so let's see how good you are now. Okay, so first graph there on the top, that's a normal graph. Okay, can you see there? There's a straight line, very small, and then there's a wide maximum amplitude, and then you see that the clot doesn't lie that quickly. So that's a normal one. So let's see how good you are, and tell me, how about the second graph in here on the right upper side? Oops. What's that? What's that? Sorry. What, what is wrong with that, with that clotting? What is it? Too fat. It's too fat. So what does that mean? This patient is overclotting. And that's incredible. You know what? I never had this diagnosed before. Actually, this patient is overclotting. And you know what? Actually, we did tag. We have tag, used tag in about 1,000 patients at Sunnybrook. And now we have about 1,000 patients on Rotem. And in fact, a third of our patients are hypercoagulable. A third. And you know what? That makes sense. If you're bleeding, what happens is you turn on your hemostasis. You go on overdrive. You overclot. But this patient is bleeding, and they're overclotting. What's going to happen if I give plasma to this patient? If I give platelet to this patient, what's going to happen? Am I going to do him any good, or am I going to harm this patient? Actually, I'm going to harm, because this patient has a mechanical bleed, not a coagulopathic bleeding. In fact, they are overclotting already. And if I keep on pushing more clotting elements into, into this patient, I'm going to cause harm. And a third of our patients are hypercoagulable, in fact. How about the lower one here, on the right-hand right side? What's the problem there? That's correct. It's too slow. Look how long it is, that line there, to start. Look what a beak it has. It takes too long to start. And once it starts, it forms a clot that's strong or weak? Weak. It's really weak. Compare that curve in there on the bottom with the curve on the top. So this here is taking too long to form the clot, and actually once it forms a clot, it's a weak clot. So this patient is what? Hypocoagulable. Okay. What does this patient need? In fact, this patient needs everything. When you have this beak in here to start with, usually you need plasma. When you have a weak clot, you need platelets and fibrinogen. I'm oversimplifying things, all right? But that's usually what it is. And this is about a third of our patients. They show up with that curve. Right? How about the last one here? That's a curve ball. Excessive fibrinolysis. So this patient actually doesn't have a bad start. It, it goes clotting quite quickly. So it's actually this patient doesn't need plasma. And it forms a reasonable clot. But what happens is this clot is dissolved too fast. So this patient forms a clot, dissolves. Forms another clot, dissolves. Forms another clot, dissolves. What's going to happen soon? 
they're not going to have enough anymore to clot, and they're going to bleed until nonstop. Okay? Right. Easy, huh? Okay, so the advantage of tag Rotam is that it's easy. They are dynamic, they can do at the bedside, they are quick, that actually can show the whole coagulation cascade from beginning to end, and they can be done at patient's temperature. So that's the beauty. But do they have problems? Of course they do. They're lab tests. They have limitations too. They sometimes are helpful, sometimes they're useless, just like any other, any other lab tests. So what are they really good for? And this is my own experience. At Sunnybrook, we have both. We have been playing with TAG and ROTAM, and I'll tell you my experience, what are they helpful for? I think they're helpful for two things. They're helpful to diagnose hyperfibrinolysis. They're helpful to diagnose a weak clot. And then there are a few other things that I'll talk about it quickly. Okay? So hyperfibrinolysis. So there's no other test that measures hyperfibrinolysis in practice. You can't. You, there's no other test that you can use during initial resuscitation of a traumatized patient that will tell you, yes, this patient lies in the clots, it's forming too fast, pathologically fast, abnormally fast. Okay? And we know that hyperfibrinolysis is bad. It's not good for your patients. Okay? Why do they do this? Why does nature, after trauma, wants to dissolve clots? Again, as I said, it's a very good question, and I hope that my lab will continue running and studying those things. Uh, but the, we know there's a clinical study called CRASH-2 that showed that if you give transemic acid, that's an anti-fibrinolytic drug, in the first three hours, you reduce mortality. So there's good clinical evidence that hyperfibrinolysis is not good for you. And this is what we see on the tag, for example, is that there's this tail in here that occurs very quickly. So this clot is being formed and is being lysed. And this is a real case. We had another day. I was not on call that day. I was a colleague of mine, fortunately. This patient, two patients came in. One patient is stable. That patient is unstable. Everybody's looking at the unstable patient. And nobody's paying attention on this patient here. And this is the tag. So the tag shows this patient has hyperfibrinolysis. As you look at the INR, INR is 1.2. OK, normal. Platelets, 137, not bad. Fibrinogen, 1.6, not bad. This patient is fine. Actually, they do a fast, find a little bit of blood inside the belly, call the OR, say, we want to operate on this patient. And OR says, well, there's an appendix starting now. Can you wait? And the surgeon did not look at the tag result. And they say, yes, we can wait. Bad decision. Two hours later, the patient is crashing. All of a sudden, the patient is crashing. How many times has that happened to you? Right? And now the INR is 3.3, almost 4, PTT incoagulable, no platelets, no fibrinogen, and look at the tag, no clotting. So what we have learned is that if you see hyperfibrinolysis on TAG and ROTAM, that's a death sentence. And this is not just our experience. So there's other published experience in the States. Kashuk, Cotton showed that 2% of their patients, Kashuk showed 18%, had hyperfibrinolysis on arrival. And of these patients, the mortality is 64%. In Houston, 76%. If your patient has hyperfibrinolysis on TAG, they're going to die. And in Europe, the same thing, Show and Levrat using Rotem, show that actually if your patients are, are hyperfibrinolytic, hyperfibrinolytic, mortality is near 100%. In my own hospital, our mortality, if we see TAG or Rotem showing hyperfibrinolysis, is about 70%. It's a death sentence for those patients. That patient that I showed you before died in the operating room for a dumb little bleeding inside his abdomen, a some completely preventable death. And the reason is the patient had no evidence of coagulopathy before because they didn't look at the tag. And the tag showed this patient had hyperfibrinolysis. This patient should have been treated differently. And that's what we have done now at my hospital. If we see tag or rotem showing hyperfibrinolysis, we say this is a death sentence, and we change the mode of resuscitating these patients. We are much, much more aggressive in treating these patients. We take them faster to the operating room. We give them bigger doses of transamic acid. Instead of giving two grams, we give 
cardiac surgery type of doses, we much more aggressively look for coagulopathy, other problems, and correct them. And I'll tell you, in the last four or five hyperfibrinolytic patients, virtually had only one death. So we have changed it. So hyperfibrinolysis is a major, major diagnosis that only TAG and Rotem can do, and for me, that's enough. If five or six percent of my patients are hyperfibrinolytic, hyperfibrinolytic and 70 percent of them are going to die, I want to know. For me, already, that justify using the test. Okay, another thing that, that it does, it shows clot strength, and this is very helpful in guiding uh, transfusion of platelets and, uh, and, and fibrinogen. And I'll tell you, there's only one number you have to remember, is the amplitude at five minutes. If the amplitude at five minutes is below 35, 77% of these patients are gonna require massive transfusion. This has been shown on TAG, has been shown on ROTEM as well too. If you have a weak clot, this patient will need transfusion and almost for sure gonna need massive transfusion. Other things to know, TAG and ROTEM, they're not INR PTT. They're totally different. So they don't, they're not substitute for the other lab tests. They add to the other lab tests. And actually everybody keeps on saying TAG and ROTEM are faster I don't know if they're faster. Actually, in my hospital, my lab takes priority for trauma patients. I get my INRs and PTTs in 15 to 20 minutes. So, and actually, Rotam takes about 10 minutes to start giving some good information. So, it's good. It can be done the bad side, but it may not be that faster. So, it's not a substitute for INR, PTT, and platelet count. You still have to do them. Okay? But the good thing about tag Rotem is that it helps you to decide what blood product to use and how much to give. And this is the arrangement we have now at Sunnybrook. We have the Rotem and the tag in the, in the central lab, and then we have a big screen in the trauma room. So as soon as this machine comes alive, this image starts forming. So you're resuscitating your trauma patient here. All you have to do is look up raise up your head and look on the wall and you can see the result going on. So there's no excuse not to use it. It's also linked to the operating room. It's also linked to the blood bank. So actually we're starting to think of automating some of the blood product delivery just based on the Rotem. If they're really abnormal, the blood bank does not need to wait for the doctor from the trauma room to call them. And so I say, look, I need plasma, I need fibrinogen. They actually will automatically start preparing those products. And this is another patient that we had, again, when came in, horrific coagulopathy, taking too long to start clotting, weak clot, huge hyperfibrinolysis, as I said, a death sentence. In the operating room, the patient was taken immediately to the operating room. In the operating room, it's not clotting at all. So what do you do for this patient? Damage control laparotomy. You pack this patient, try to get out of there as quickly as possible. In the OR, non-coagulable, by the time they got in the ICU, start correcting their hypothermia, their acidosis, and so on, this patient's already looking much better. Okay? And that's the beauty about this test. It's actually, they tell you the problem is coagulopathy. And the problem is coagulopathy because the clot is too weak, or because they're hyperfibrinolytic, or because there's something else wrong with this patient. And this is a recent patient that we have, and I'm not gonna go into the details, but basically this patient came in, again, everything normal on this patient, not bad initially, but then when we did the, the, the Rotem, you tell me, what's wrong with that Rotem? Okay. What's wrong? What's wrong? <laughs> what? Amplitude is low. So what does that mean? This patient needs what? So the amplitude is small means the clot is weak. This patient needs what? Fibrinogen or platelets. We knew this patient platelets were okay. Actually, this patient was a Jehovah's Witness and was refusing blood products, but then this patient agreed to have uh, fibrinogen concentrate, and we gave this patient fibrinogen concentrate, and it corrected this patient coagulopathy. Okay? So this is a type of work that we would never be able to do if had to use INR, PTT, and some other common tests. So this is the end. So what do I think about Tegro 10? Interesting worthwhile investigating, worthwhile studying, worthwhile considering it. Okay? They are not the solution to all our problems, not, not by a far shot. They are not perfect tests. I think they add to the current lab that we have. 
And the additional things that Tegrotem give us is that it can show hyperfibrinolysis that no one can, and also can show us which patients may need blood and what blood or blood product this patient needs. Okay? So once again, I want to thank you very much. It has been a privilege to be here and be part of this meeting.